Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm pleased to welcome Jeff Gibbs, who is a new acquaintance of mine. He is the director of Planet of the Humans. Jeff, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Uh, thanks for having me, Robert. Really, it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and to, to meet you, um, you know, face to face, at least virtually face to face at last. And uh, sure, I think we're at a time when it's great for people that um, may not agree on everything to actually talk to each other. So thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Now, I didn't warn you. So this is something of an ambush, but guests on this podcast introduce themselves. So imagine you've arrived somewhere, you don't know anyone and you have about 60 seconds, please introduce yourself. Well, first of all, I'm a human. I'm a member of a species that I think is in some trouble, and that's probably why I'm doing this. Sure. But uh, my background is, um, you know, I've an original hippie homesteader, exploring new ways to live, trying to find a way out of this. And uh, I wound up, um, you know, I was going to begin writing about the environment, and I uh, wound up hooking up with my friend from Flint, Michael Moore, and um, producing, uh, never having worked on a film before, Bowling for Columbine. Many of the famous scenes you see, like the bank that gives you a gun, the dog that shoots Hunter, Michigan militia. I'm from that very neighborhood in Flint. I didn't ruin my friend's film, so they invited me back to work on um, on uh, Fahrenheit 9-11. Um, and that turned out well, too. Both those films smashed box office records by uh, multiple orders you know, of magnitude and won an Oscar in the Palm d'Or. And then, meanwhile, I, instead of getting like a spiffy film career, I have really been obsessed with the environment and um, just really spent the last two de decades in addition to making and scoring, producing and scoring some other films, um, really doing the research that, that underlies Planet of the Humans and the filming. So my passion is, um, I think, you know, I think we're in a, not in the time of climate change, but in the time of overshoot. And I think we're in the, also the time of um, delusions leading us astray. I think well, delusions are a human superpower. So sure. I think the common thing sure. we're going to have a conversation about is the delusion that there is such a thing as green energy and the delusion that it's going to save us from whatever we're fearing. Um, so that's well, that's my well, life. Good. Well, that, that that's a good introduction. And I want to talk about those delusions because we chatted the other day and you said that Planet of the Humans was, I'm quoting here, uh, our delusions told through the lens of green energy. But I want to come back to that. And uh Tell me about, bring us back up to date now. It's been almost three years, if memory serves, since I think you, uh, Planet of the Humans came out April of 2020. It's almost three years. What's happened since then? Because it was, when the film came out, it got a lot of press and it was very controversial. A lot of people tried to, some high, high academics from elite universities tried to get the film banned. I mean, there are some things that are just truly remarkable that I want to discuss, but bring us up to date in terms of what for you has happened in the three years since the film has come out. Well, you know, to recap what you're talking about and to be clear, um, there's a, a great uh, piece in the gray zone um, about the billionaires that attacked the film. And really, um, pretty much everyone that attacked us um, has had funding from the very um, giant foundations and billionaires that were kind of skewered in the film or shown up to be not, you know, what we think, not not the um, climate or environmental friendly uh, folks uh, that we've been led to believe. So, so name names. That, so name people, name name names. There, the billionaires. Who who are you talking about? Sure. Well, Josh Fox. Um, you know, you mentioned as one of the attackers. He uh, received funding from the Rockefeller Brothers um, Fund. Um, Bill McKibben. Is probably the most notorious of the attackers. He wrote a long piece filled with lies that just baffling lies in um, the Rolling Stone. I don't even think he um, saw the movie, but he, of course, was shown in the film to be asking for agreeing to raise fifty trillion dollars for the green energy billionaires. Uh -huh. And of course, his three fifty dot org, his organization. I don't know what his personal situation is with investments. People have asked him and he has given a coy answer, but um, the rock 350.org was basically a startup of the Rockefeller brothers, this giant hedge fund right. um, foundation. And also he, re, he, when he stumbles over and can't quite remember who gets, he gets his funding from one of these uh, was a giant uh, Swedish foundation 
it was also he you know he happens to mention making it sound like a small family front so a lot of the groups that you think are grassroots are actually uh either startup concepts or um they're they're love being launched by these these billionaires and or their foundations the sierra club um i just happened to look up uh, the sierra club's current net worth i think it's uh, at least $300 million. Uh, and maybe that's just their income for this year. I have to look at the details. I think it's so 100. And I, my, my, I just had a piece in Substack today, and it was $180 million for is their latest annual report. But let me ask the question this way, Jeff. I guess because I think all of what you're saying is interesting, and I, I, I forgive me for interrupting, but why were they so threatened by this film? I guess that's the part that to me is intriguing. And there was the there were several academics that, as you mentioned, you mentioned Josh Fox, who wrote... Uh, Oh, uh, well, I forgot the name. Of it. He's an anti movie, gas, land. Ga gas land. And he bragged on Twitter that several people, including Michael Mann from U University of Pennsylvania, Mark Jacobson from Stanford, Leah Stokes from University of California, Santa Barbara, were not only asking that the film be pulled off of uh, for broadcast, but uh, demanding an apology from Michael Moore. Why, why? This is the question I think more than any other I wanted to put to you. Why do you think these people and these these groups were so threatened by your film? Again, um, Mark Jacobson, the pictures and some of the details have been removed, but Mark Jacobson is a prime um, uh, band leader for this concept that we're going to run the world on 100% renewable energy. But right. very early on, um, I forget which billionaire it is, but he, he actually, as... He was formulating this um, concept. He actually formed a group with Josh Fox and some billionaires to actually promote the idea that they're going to profit from this. So I don't know Leah Stokes or, or Michael Mann as well, but uh, clearly for many of the people involved in the attacks, they got they got in bed with the billionaires. Now, for Leah and for Michael Mann, again, I'm not sure, but... All of these people have staked their reputations and their careers on the idea that climate change, the carbon dioxide molecule, that is the threat to humanity and to life on Earth of our time. And they stake their basically their reputations on the idea that if only we invested in renewable energy, we'll be saved and the, the planet will be saved. So Here's a film that is saying that the Green Emperor has no clothes. Everything you've been telling people is going to save us from impending doom is a mirage. And worse than that, it's just a way of enriching um, the 1%, the billionaires, um, and keeping us all kind of in this, this haze of like it's all going to be okay. So... If if you know, only think, if only we change course and adopt more wind and solar, that that's the salvation that we as humans. Yeah. I, I think of it in religious terms a lot of times because there is a lot of overlap between the climate catastrophes and Christianity, right? That we've sinned and we seek redemption, right? And the way we are going to get redemption is reducing our carbon footprint and getting back in tune with Mother Nature. That there's a very sim there's a lot of overlap there. Does that rhyme with how you see it in terms of? kind of just human beliefs. Yes and no. Go ahead. I think the climate catastrophists are basically a bunch of babies who can't face how bad things are. Explain. How do you mean? So first of all, the way I summarize what they're trying to say is climate change plus renewable energy equals we're saved, right? Uh -huh. So the commonality with re religion is I believe that the pro-nuclear people have the same religious tendencies. I believe that people that are pro fossil fuels have the same religious tendencies. I believe the people that think that we're going to just have regenerative agriculture, some new magic agriculture. I think we as humans, as you see in the film, um, are in denial that we're reach we're hitting multiple limits. So the climate movement has oversimplified the situation and boiled it only down to one thing. So we live in a time when 97%, I know you've read the studies of mammals, have been displaced by humans and farm animals. So 97% of the mammals, and this is not you know, really in question, it's just the way it is. Only 3% of the wild animals that were here when humans arose still exist. Half of those have went extinct, or been not extinct, but been wiped out in the last few decades. So 
ninety percent of the fish in the ocean are gone. Ninety, you know, there's different studies that show the insect apocalypse that we're currently living with. There are other reports from the UN that show that uh, we're in a toxic planet nightmare. In other words, toxic chemicals alone could spell the end of life as we've experienced it. Um, so all of these, you know, let's just think about the decline of um, nature. All you know, the fish being gone in the sea don't have anything to do with climate change, even though they're trying to climb it in to um, connect it furiously. That, that's because we ate them. That we the males are not over, gone. Over, we overfished. So, so your overfished. argument. So, so what I'm hearing you and just to repeat back, Jeff, because uh, you're saying that there is a there's a, a, a religiosity around this, and is that and this I, these ideas? Would you say that that we're in denial that we are reaching our limits? I think I, I'm quoting you directly uh, right. directly there. So, was that your motivation then for talk me? Let's go back a, a step back a little bit to when you started working on the film. So, the film's been out right. roughly three years. It's had three million views, thirteen million, forgive me, uh, thirteen million views on YouTube, which is a, a, a no a, more more like twenty million. Oh, more like twenty. Okay, right. Well, I just Let looked at explain. one. Go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, there. The movie was so popular that was the other they were threat, threatened. Is it ten or twenty people cloned the movie and put it up for free on YouTube? Uh -huh. um, it was uh, it was being put distributed on BitTorrent. Um, since then, we've got it on Amazon Prime. It's on iTunes. It's on uh, YouTube Studios. Multiple platforms. So the cha the one channel you see um, is just the tip of the iceberg. I actually was think I actually asked the other people to take off their YouTube clones. They did, but people have been doing it anyways, and some of them have hundreds of thousands of views. So sure. Um, and by the way, we're, we're, before you get to your next point, just to be clear, there are tens of thousands of comments on our main YouTube channel. Ninety percent plus are either positive or just stunned, like, "What the hell?" You know, um, this movie really floored me. So very few attacks from civilians. The attacks have all come from people with either a financial or reputational interest in the climate change plus green energy equals we're saved narrative. Mm. Um, and to be yeah, clear, you can also, I this, but if, if I could interject, so people can watch it on YouTube, obviously, but uh, it, also your website, planetofthehumans.com is another place where they can watch it. And so I just want to make get that very clear. So yep. 20 million views now. So by uh, any standard metric, I, I think in terms of documentaries, that would be considered a very successful rollout. Now, we'll talk about the economics later, but walk me back then, Jeff, to where you you spent something like, I think you recall you worked on it for eight years on, on your own. And then you you're, then you called on your friend Michael Moore and his name helped you, you know, get some momentum is to, when, when did you start filming the project? Okay, just to be clear, Michael came in when the film was almost completely done. Sure. And just gave sure. tips and advice and then helped get it get it out there. But yeah, um, no, I probably solidly was filming for eight years. But, you know, I've been actually probably filming and researching for 20 years. Um, the, um, you know, I was just in that phase of life where I was, you know, had been really concerned about the environment when I was younger and kind of let it go and did the normal things of, you know, having a career and I was, I was trying to drop, kind of drop out and live in the woods, built a log house. Um, but I was just starting to notice, huh, why is it that the ski resorts are closed? Um, huh, why is the golf course, people are still sneaking on the golf course in Northern Michigan in January. The trees don't look right. There's, you know, the trees that I've been seeing in Michigan all my life appear to be dying everywhere. And then I read about sudden oak death in, in California. I see these invasive zebra mussels that are razor sharp come into Lake Michigan and within a few years take over the entire lake and invade inland lakes. And in, in one, in two seasons, this lake I used to swim in went from, you couldn't walk into the lake without stepping on a freshwater clam to the next year, no clams. And you couldn't walk into the lake without stepping on a zebra mussel, which are razor sharp and you had to wear shoes, um, water shoes. So, I just decided, is this the time that we've been hear fearing or hearing about our entire lives where things are beginning to snap and why are they snapping? And I began with the trees. I actually um, flew out to California and interviewed the guy who discovered sudden oak death. And um, we together discovered sudden oak death spreading to the redwoods. Um, I had a contract with Sierra Magazine to write this big story on dying trees. Um, I was 
you know, writing for Alternet and HuffPost. And uh, I was really going to get into writing, but then my friend Michael started making Bowling for Columbine. Um, so as I got involved with Bowling for Columbine, I said, I'm going to use what I've learned to make a film about the environment that might shake people up. Now, the thing that led us down a similar path was I really filmed a whole film on what I would call the the, the stress or even the downfall of nature on, on, on the signs of collapse that, that we're not noticing. Um, but I slowly became convinced that that wasn't what was in the way. What was in the way of uh, people seeing that the environment is in some trouble was this weird thing where keep, people kept saying, solar, solar, solar. And I'm like, how are solar panels going to make the fish come back into the sea? Hmm. I don't quite get that. How are they going to bring the forest back? That we've, you know, 70% of the original forests have been logged on this planet. Um, if you're concerned about the trees being logged, you know, what do wind turbines have to do with that? And then I discovered that not only, you know, like right now, the number one source of deforestation in Virginia is to install solar panels. But then I discovered right in the middle of this, that this thing called biomass, that the environmentalists were now endorsing us cutting down trees and burning them everywhere. And these plants are everywhere, as you see in the movie. You just don't notice them because they look like little fossil fuel power plants. Sure. And then I discovered that it's the number one source of green energy in Germany, and nobody talks about that. Um, and it just blew my mind that a so-called environmentalist, you know, who grew up, you know, I grew up with, you know, save the rainforest, save the whale, right? But now we're going to be burning the forest. And then I even found a clip where some people were burning leftovers from whaling as biofuel. It's like, that's when I realized we've lost our minds. That's what's in the way, not just making people aware that the environment um, has some problems. It's that. Uh, the environment movement has lost its mind, and so let me um, so let me inter interrupt because I just want to repeat back your what your timeline is there because I just looked up Bowling for Columbine came out in two thousand two. So you were formulating your ideas or, for Planet of the Humans then, well, something like twenty years ad, in it before Planet of the Humans I, actually was made. So this was some ideas around your worldview that and ideas that you wanted to cover uh, biomass, the rest of it really had percolated for you. So this is a 20 year project before it actually hit them. I mean, is that fair that this is something that you had been ruminating on and collecting string on? I, I understand that because I just published a piece I'd collecting yeah. string on for more than a year. But uh, tell, tell me about that. Why? Right. Yeah. How much? Did, how much? What was your budget? Let me let me ask a specific question. How much did you spend there was no on budget. the film? There's, but, but see, one of the things people need to know about um, filmmaking, um, I, and maybe this is true of your book. Somebody might ask you, how long did it take you to write that book? Well, it took me six months or a year or three years. But the book is a result of 10 years, five years, 30 years, a lifetime of research. And so, uh, yeah, that rhymes um, with that rhymes with what I know that that the yeah, it, well, I, that we're the sum of our lives, right? That we our lived experience yeah. allows us to do this, right? So, you know, I've written a few books. And yeah, but it's my it's the sum of my experience that comes together the actual writing. Well, that's only a fraction of the time that I've actually put into the project. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think that that that, yeah, that yeah, that's exactly it. Like when I was a homesteader, it's briefly in the film, but when I moved to the woods and I I, I, I cut out some lines that maybe will be in the next film. But you know, so I'm a young hippie, I moved to the woods. What's the first thing I have to do? You know, because I want to be close to nature and live in a log. Well the first thing I have to do is chop down the trees, right? The next thing I have to do is build bring in a bulldozer to clear a, a path. Then the next thing I have to do is cut down some more trees for my firewood. So um it's slow and then then I was asking myself questions like, well, if civilization falls apart, where am I going to get a wood stove? Uh, I guess I could scavenge how about a piece of glass? Right. Um yeah. So or, it's or a lifetime or, of care, or kerosene for when the stove is out or you know the, those other yeah. things that are essential to keep you safe and warm. But so, well, let me just back up if you don't mind. So you mentioned you're from Flint and you'd known Michael Moore since you were kids, it sounds like. Is that is that right? Um, yes, I was from the neighborhood. Uh, by the way, it's the 20th anniversary of um, Falling for Columbine winning the uh, Oscar for Best uh, Documentary um, next in, in March, this March. So, uh -huh. um, And your role but, on that film was what? I'm sorry, what did you do for you? were You shot some of those- producer. Uh -huh. And then okay. I was also the composer, but I tend to downplay the composer part because I was after working on the setting up all these scenes that you see in the film for a year and a half or two. Um, 
they came and Michael called and said, oh, we lost our deal with our composer. You think you can come and help us? And I, oh, by the way, you've got five days. <laughs> so I went to New York and actually composed the original underscore music, you know, in, in uh, five days. And then I stuck around and did some other things on the film. So and you're and, 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 I grew well, up that's, that's an you're, you're, it's kind of a throwaway line you're tossing in there so are you a pianist what do you play what instruments do you play uh i can't even play happy birthday on the piano but i i do improvisational keyboard stuff and uh the drums so i just went there and did it by feel and um no kidding you know wow. then stuck around Huh. So, but you but you knew flint uh, you, you, you mentioned you're from flint and so did, how, how long have you known michael moore Yes, since 1971. So that's a long time. And then you yeah. started, you, so you made several films with him, including Bowling for Columbine, Fair, uh, Bowling for Com Columbine Fahrenheit 9-11. Um, and then <clears throat> you started making, well, you were making Planet of the Humans, it sounds like all, of the, you know, for a lot of this time. And then you get toward the end of the film, and then that's when you went back to Michael and he came in. You mentioned that he came in at the very end of the film. How did that, how did that work? What, how did that uh, come about? And what was his value to you in, yeah. uh, in getting the film seen and heard and, and, and the rest of it? Because he's arguably, well, maybe with Alex Gibney, the most, fam most famous, most successful documentary maker in America. Oh, I think far more than Alex Gibney. Okay. I think if I Fair. went down the street of Paris City and stop 20 people i don't think i don't one have heard of alex gibney maybe three but um everybody would have heard of michael um sure but the enough. um sure. yeah he no he and i have always been friends so we were you know he was the first person i ever mentioned the title plan of the humans to um and he was like that's great before i even knew it was going to be about what it's about uh, so he's always been we've been commiserating we do this about all of our work um and in, informally and then Right towards the end, um, you know, we had, um, you know, I was working in isolation here in Northern Michigan. So um, uh, I met somebody who could help with the editing. You know, I edited most of it, but I need, you know, you got to have somebody else involved. Um, just, you know, you got to have other eyes on it. Ozzy came here. Uh, Michael was here. So we and all kind of and, 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 and just to add, you're talking about Ozzy, Ozzy Zayner, who is one of the people who's in the film. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Ozzy does, Ozzy doesn't live in Michigan. He's in, where, where does he live? He's in the San Francisco area. Okay. But gotcha. he's and, from Michigan. Right. But you're, you're now living in Beulah, Michigan, if I recall, is that right? Just south of Traverse city. Yeah. South of Traverse city. So anyway, I interrupted, so uh, forgive me, but uh, then, so you started talking with Michael and then you'd done most of the editing on the film and then you, uh, he came into the project. Didn't really come into the project. I think you're, you know, I, again, I've done this out of my house. Okay. So, okay. you know, so, you know, he was in Traverse city watching cuts, you know, came out here a few times to watch things. So, um, yeah, it's that, that's the nature of it. Um, basically the best way to look at the film is, uh, every single thing you see in the film, the set in the film, every cut in the film, um, it's basically is 100% mine with some input from other people. Gotcha. Um, Okay. So that's that's the unfortunate thing in their attacks is that um, Michael deserves much credit for supporting me and getting this film out here. But, um, you know, like the, um, I'll give you an example, like the how solar and wind scene are made. Yeah. How, how yeah. solar and wind electric cars are made that scene. Um, I think that idea f came up, um, you know, after I had interviewed Ozzy and um, we were all tossing around some ideas there, but I, I, I spent probably two years. I knew it would take a couple of years just to get that scene. There are, you know, dozens, if not a couple hundred archival clips in that. And I had to sync it up to the music, uh, and then work for almost a year to get the rights to the music that are under that, that, that piece. So, uh -huh. um, yeah, it's been, it was quite the journey to get to this point. And that's one of the disappointments is that, um, um, it, we're, I'm so happy that we got out to tens of millions of people, but it's just, um, the response of people that we thought would be, um, allies or at least want to have the conversation is just a huge disappointment. You know, what, what occurs to me, Jeff, as you're saying that is a, a friend of mine, um, Dick Revis, um, wrote, uh, one of the best books about the Branch Davidians. It's called the ashes of Waco. And, 
uh, Revis was a dyed in the wool Marxist and I've, I've lost touch with him, but he lives in Dallas now and, and was one of the people who encouraged me to look into the Branch Davidian uh, issue. And I, I covered that trial, the civil trial in Waco back in 2000 or something. But Revis wrote that book and he, um, he, it was a guy from the, from the, from the left. And he said, well, I, I put the book out and I didn't have any allies on the left. He said, the only people that wanted to talk to me were the people on the right. And so that I'm only bringing that up because it, it, you know, you made a film that's very provocative. It got a lot of attention. And rather than getting any love from the left, which are, is, I'm, if I'm hearing you right, you think those are your, nat those are your people that you thought those were your people. And yet they disavowed you. Am I, or am I misreading what, what, right. what you're saying? And again, we're talking about the leadership of the left and those allied with um, corporate and, uh, you know, and banker and billionaire and funding, including their foundations. But again, those tens of thousands of comments that are supportive that are on our YouTube channel, which people can see themselves, right. or, you know, that, that are not attacks. Uh, we had a profound impact on grassroots environmentalists and citizens. Um, and I dare say both left and right. I, you know, yeah. I, when I, I actually fought biomass plants from coming to Traverse City, um, and we wound up organizing, you know, after I got things rolling, a, a group. But it was, it was kind of fun, and these discussions can be fun, because I went on the college radio station, and I went on the right-wing talk radio station, and I love that because the Fox guys didn't know what to do. You know, the Clear Channel didn't know what to do with me. It's like, we're just two guys talking. Right. You know, now we're not like, you know, Republicans and Democrats. Um, and we each have something to learn. Um, so it, it, I feel like I, I hear weekly, if not daily, from people that this film changed their lives. Um, and from so. Well, that's yeah, got to be that's, that's got to that, that, that's got to be gratifying. And that's why they wanted to leave the impression that this you shouldn't watch this film. You know, we went through, through the same that they, thing that Fahrenheit they were afraid that they were afraid people would be indoctrinated or that they'd change their mind or wouldn't be on their side or that, well, that there's some fear. Was it fear? They were afraid of the film fear because, because the film was so powerful. You know, if Michael Morris executive produced a couple other films that he didn't make, but you've never heard of them. I, I don't even know if I could find them, but I, a couple other people, you know, he blown his. Um, endorsement to and the films went nowhere so th the film is what they're, they're afraid of because it actually can change hearts and minds um and but we went th been through this before you know the think of, think about the um oscar what michael went through after winning the oscar i mean he was i think the boons were a lot of them were piped in but he was the microphone was cut off um you know when he spoke up just so people don't know it Instead of like thanking all of us for helping to make the film, he said, you know, um, that we're in a time of war and a time of lies and, you know, basically shame on you, you know, President Bush. And he was kind of booed off the stage. People told him his career would be over. Um, you know, the uh, very I only remember one of our Hollywood liberal friends coming directly to his response at the, uh, to his defense. Um, but now. Uh, at least on the left, what's controversial on Bowling for Columbine? It's like one of the iconic films, documentaries of all time. The same thing with Fahrenheit 9-11. Um, he started being, you know, getting threatened. His career is threatened. I mean, we actually sort of made that film some man hiding. Um, so much was controversial. But what's controversial on Fahrenheit 9-11 now? You know, the drive to war to make people rich. Right. Uh, and it is upside down world because... And we live in a time when MSNBC and CNN um, are not having any anti-war in Ukraine voices, but Fox is. It's like, okay, it's just... It's just well, that's, it's, well, that's an interesting point, and I want to build on that, because when we talked the other day, when we in advance of our conversation today, um, I wrote this down. You said it can't be conservatives talking about these issues. It's important for liberals and progressives to point all the all, at all the problems because we have to bridge this divide if we're going to make any headway. We need to get out of our silos. Both sides are equally insane. Um, so 
You mentioned the local activism around biomass. I've seen this myself in, in terms of opposition. I've, I've documented many times uh, land use conflicts and that in small towns, small counties, rural counties that in talking to people who are fighting these projects and they don't get any outside money, despite all these absurd claims that, oh, yeah, there's oil money or the cokes. I mean, it's all baloney. I mean, it's just bullshit from the beginning. But what I've heard over and over from these mostly women, middle aged women working from their kitchen tables is that we organize the community around this one issue. We're fighting this solar project, we're fighting this wind project. And these we may be Republicans or Democrats, but we're united on this one thing. We're trying to protect our neighborhood. Is that does that ring true to you? I, I think you, you hinted at that before about some of these right, projects yeah. that you covered that that it brings people together in a way they hadn't been united before and probably won't be united again. But they had a common foe and that that was uniting. Is that does that ring true to you? Yeah, and that's, um, you know, when I and usually it was a company. corporate it was a corporate foe, right? I mean, that was almost always the case, right? It's some big usually, oftentimes a foreign corporation, right? Trying to push these projects through. Anyway, I interrupt. But is, is that does that ring true to you? Right after. So, you know, it's only a couple years after making Bowling for Columbine, Fahrenheit 9-11. You know, I live in this community. Um, I've done presentations on the dying trees. I've written for the local um, media on issues with trees, on issues with these zebra mussels, on, um, you know, energy issues. So, but Keith Schneider, who happened to be uh, right for the New York Times and happened to be um, working for this, you know, local environmental group, but he had, he, he got uh, hired by Van Jones and the members Van Jones um, yeah. had all these, yeah. um, uh, these green initiatives. He was actually in San Francisco working um, for Van Jones as communications director or something. Um, but he actually was fly, hired to fly back here and fight us local people on this. Um, and on he wrote a, on, a bi on, a bio on a biomass project. On was a it? Biomass plant. Yeah. They hired four different consultants to fight us. They brought in people from um, several universities. They brought, it, brought in some people from um, biomass people from Canada. And I happened to look it up and the biomass people were the same people that were their, their, their investment group is investing in the tire sands. Um, but he, that's when I first heard the accusations right after I just finished working on Fahrenheit 9 11, um, that I was being funded by the Koch brothers. Uh huh. 15 years ago. It's like, um, and, was, and is that true? You're getting checks from the Kochs? Yeah, I've been looking for my check. It's just, it hasn't, <laughs> no, yeah. It, uh, Must have been no, lost, in the, lost, to, in, lost in the mail somewhere. I put, um, I wouldn't take money from anybody with any energy interest, um, you know, because rightly or wrongly, it's it's a conflict of interest. And I think even if you support green energy, you know, all of us, look, all of us would be shudder to think that somebody had a grassroots group funded by the oil companies that relentlessly pushing oil and attacking every other energy source. You know, that's that's just almost a catechism on the left, right? That that was, that's horrible. But yet, if you're taking money, um, you know, from from the, so, from the solar or wind crowd funds, or the biomass crowd, then it then it's different. What do you think the What do you think the Rockefeller Fund is invested in? They're not invested in snowmobiles and toilet paper. They, well, they might be, but they have a vested interest. If we were to, to be able to take a deep dive, so all of these even foundations um, that are pushing the uh, the, the fake green agenda are profiting from two things. They're, they're almost certainly directly invested in these technologies and, in, in, but they're also invested in profiting from an economic system addicted to growth. So even if they're not invested directly, they have to keep this machine going um, or they're going to fall off a cliff. Um, and, and by the way, when I say that I believe that, all, I think all humans have a belief system, including belief systems that we're unaware of that protect us from our fears of death and mm. our fears, you know, our fears in general. And that's at, basically passes quickly, but it's at the heart of the movie. But I just want to be clear um, as I approach my next work, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't think we can just pull the carpet from up from underneath everything and just watch it fall apart. I don't think we can continue on as we are. Um, I don't think that there's any technological miracles that are going to uh, avert catastrophe. Uh, I think green energy is the least likely thing to do anything 
to avert catastrophe uh, because because it basically green energy is just everything that's destroying the planet. Um, what's what's the right word? It's been everything destroying the planet rebranded as carbon free in order to keep doing more of it. Um, so, but I so actually don't so know. So how this well, is Mer Mer I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Meredith Angwin says she calls renewable a marketing term. I don't, I don't call it renewable anymore. I call it alt energy or alternative energy. I don't, uh, because I think green or clean Delusional energy. Delusional energy. Delusional. That's a sharp uh, adjective, but I think alternative. I would call it delusional because the difference between, um, and again, I'm not a fan of nuclear. I'm not a fan of fossil fuels. I'm not a fan of hydro or anything else. But the difference between solar and wind and the other technologies is they nowhere on planet Earth are they freestanding run anything you know um because you you can't run anything uh, on intermittent energy um and that's just it's a stunner than they've been able to get away with um oh well we're gonna have batteries yeah okay um in michigan the sun has barely shown for the last two months uh even in germany their solar output in winter is 10 times less than it is in this at the peak in the summer so what? I, how many batteries would I need to store the energy from when? Last September, last July, you to get us through? It, it's an impossible. That's it. It's the height of delusion. That's why you know we we were. Ozzy wrote green illusions, but I think it's just an outright delusion. But, um, but we've got some really difficult things I think to work out as as to how we're going to get out of this bottleneck of what I see as overshoot as opposed to climate which is just a subset um well so then let's you mention those different you're not a fan of nuclear you're not a fan of hydrocarbons well so what do you what do you propose then jeff i mean that's one of the things i'm i'll put my cards on the table i've been saying the same thing for a long time yeah. 13 years end to end natural gas to nuclear if we're serious about decarbonizing to serious about reducing emissions those are the two sources that have the lowest carbon footprint they're abundant they're they're well known the resources are, are widely available what are what are you in favor of not in favor of anything well then how do we run the world then how do we run the global economy i'm in favor what? of us the general outline of this is I'm in favor of a plan that leads to less of everything we're doing and not introducing new worse things uh you know in the process because the, so does that, um, mean, does that mean degrowth then because that's one of the the, the ideas that's yeah. put forward by a lot of people on the left we need including Bill McKibben that we need to shrink our economy we need to use less everyone should use less and that economic growth should we should reduce economic growth does that is that your your stance yeah, yeah. Although, the, again, the reason I don't say that directly is because everything gets perverted. You know, the degrowth de movement, as soon as they get started getting funded conferences, it got all watered down. And so they, they want degrowth with solar and wind um, and hydro and electric cars. It's like that just is that's that's just like, um, again, uh, you know, to me, that's um, uh, they're shooting themselves in the foot. And that's what I've been noticed about uh, this movement forever is that they. They'll say something that has some truth to it and then shoot themselves in the foot. So uh, the, the the degrowth movement has kind of been perverted um, to me. And I don't, uh, that's why on this next journey, this next film, I'm actually going to talk hopefully to people like you, you know, to people who believe what Bill McKibben does, if not him, people who um, think that we can um, go back to tribal ways, you know, um, people who think that um, we'll, you know, maybe they believe in the singularity and think that's, you know, I, I, I I'm kind of, just going to see where this goes because I don't think we have a plan. And um, you know, in, in fairness, um, I think the nuclear pro nuclear movement has latched onto the carbon issue. I'm, that's not my issue. I don't know why it's now being used as an excuse to say nuclear is better than everything else. That's why, you know, you know, I'll, I'll be upfront with you about my questions when sure. you know down the road we talk sure. about nuclear, yeah. but. Um, yeah. Just to give you one example, in researching the, the, the latest delusion, which is called fusion, uh, complete delusion. I mean, right. it, it, delusional compared to solar, it's it's delusional times, you know, 100. I mean, for many <laughs> reasons. But one yeah. of the basic things that yeah. gets ignored by solar and wind, fission nuclear, and fusion 
is that they're extraordinarily complex technologies. So one of the critiques of um, fusion, and by the way, you often get the best critiques of other energy sources from the people who oppose it because right. the people pushing it kind of block them out. So it was est it's estimated that, that you may need 20,000 people to run a fusion facility. Well, fair enough, and, 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 and I'm not I'm not here to promote fusion because I think that you know I, I'm I'm 62. I've heard about fusion since I was a kid. It's always 50 yeah. years away. You know, maybe now it's so, 40 years away. But I, but but so just to be clear about fission, which I think has great promise, and I but let, and, let me finish my sentence. Okay, sure. So fission, you know, takes about two thousand people to run a nuclear plant, according to this article on fusion. But it takes a huge number of experts. You may know that have them at the top of your head, but a large number of experts, each supported by an academic institution, each supported by a discipline um, to make a nuclear um, fission plant work. So there are aspects of each energy source that the people promoting, you know, as the answer, kind of that, those 2000 people that have to be involved, including the, the perhaps hundreds of experts that have to exist on each aspect of each metal, you right. know, and, um, mm -hmm. That those people have a huge footprint, and forget not only the carbon part that never gets calculated. So that's again switching back to renewables. When you tell me that oh, when it's um, not sunny out, we're going to have wind, uh, and then we're going to have transmission lines and um, you know inverters and converters and you know infrastructure for those two. Now you've doubled it. Oh, but those two alone won't do it. So we're going to have batteries. And then the batteries have a way bigger footprint than solar and wind. So now you've basically quadrupled it, plus the power infrastructure. Oh, well, that might be not enough. So we're going to fill it in with hydro. We're going to fill it in with nuclear. We're going to fill it in with gas. Now you're talking about five or six systems. So that's just one of the things to be explored down the road is all these systems are extremely complex. And one of my lines is not in the movie is neither nuclear, solar as we know it, wind as we know it, um, giant hydroelectric plants, none of these technologies existed before fossil fuels. And the a giant fossil fuel based industrial civilization that underlies all this. So our assumption that any of this will survive a fossil fuel based civilization with this basically burning through a million years of stored ancient sunlight per year to enable all of the mining, all of the smelting, all of the um, construction, all of the humans that are alive. The idea that any of these technologies will um, survive the demise of this fossil fuels and industrial civilization is just an interesting conjecture, how we believe that somehow we burn through these 100 million years of fuels in 100 or 200 years, they're going to go away, and we're just going to have a soft, happy landing into some other t energy source. I I think that's just an interesting speculation. I'd like to talk with a, a lot of people about how they see think that's going to actually work. Sure. Well, so let me press you on this a little bit, Jeff, because you know yeah. I'm I, I think this what you're, you're talking about is interesting, and I and as I, you know, I'm a I'm an optimist in the late in the words of the late Molly Ivins, I'm optimistic to the point of idiocy. Um, and great writer, you know, by the way, Molly. Yeah, yes, yes, and uh, late great Molly Ivins. Um, you saw George Bush as the real person that he was before the Democrats had a clue. And that's why he won. But go ahead. Well, yes. well, she and she blurred my first book on Enron now 20 years ago. So I'm, I'll always uh, have, okay. have have her in high regard. So I'm an optimist. But w w when I hear you talk about how you see the world I, and, and I'm just hearing it, I'm just feeding it back to you. No, yeah. you know, not bring you on to insult you or offend you. But it seems like <laughs> you ahead. have you have a religious view as well. Right. The, the religious mean? view of I mean, it's a it's a strong, held, strongly held one. And I, you know, I respect that. But is that is your worldview? Is it is it, we all have our own biases, our own worldviews? Can you critique your own worldview and see? You know, because I can is, hearing you talk, I can think. Well, look at me, and I'm thinking. Well, Bryce, maybe you're just deluding yourself too. That we're going to run out of hydrocarbons, we're going to foul, we're going to shit in our own nest, and it's all going to you know things could fall apart. And I see that very clearly. So I, I can entertain that idea, but. Can you also entertain the other idea that, well, maybe things would work out, that we're, just, we're, we're stumbling along, but everything's going to be okay? But can you describe for me what you think is going to work out? Well, you know, I, I guess I'll put it this way, that, that Malthus has been, you know, Malthusians have been around for a long time and that we were going to, you know, Paul Ehrlich's, you know, estimates, we're going to run out of food. 
And over time, he's yet to be proven right. Now, if we wait long enough, he might be proven right. But so far, Malthus and Ehrlich have been proven wrong. So is it possible, I'm just posing this to you, is it possible that you're wrong, that maybe your outlook is too grim? I don't think in terms of grim or um, optimist. I think both of those are mistakes. I think being an optimist is, is, a, um, is a mistake and being a pessimist is a mistake. I think. So you um, see yourself you as do, just an absolute realist then? Is that, am, am I, am I, I'm, I don't, I'm not trying to put words in your, so you see yourself sure. as an absolute realist looking at the world through, un, yes. with, un, with unvarnished eyes or unvarnished view. Is that, is that fair? Well, that, that's the goal. We, you know, we're always working to get there. And, you know, when I was making Planet of the Humans, every time I would hear some new bit of hopium come out, you know, I, even though I knew it couldn't be right, I'd race to the computer, start looking up, you know, the actual, science behind this and the physics and what's actually happening and you know but i kind of i do have a constant need to, to check the math so you may not know this i had a, had a long career as a therapist as a social worker and i was doing a phd in systems theory mm. so in, in a sense my life before doing this or before right film before film before, before film before, film, before filmmaking yes was deconstructing human illusions and our self-defeating behaviors. And so um, so I'll just give you a little twist how I see things differently. I don't sure. think, I think it's, it's realistic. So we see our human existence in too small of a frame. So Malthus, Paul Ehrlich, these, these, are, these have all occurred in the blip of an instant in geological and biological time. So okay. that, that they didn't come true instantly it me is meaningless. So... Malthus and Ehrlich underestimated our ability, what these the fossil fuels we tapped into were going to do in terms of increasing everything. Um, but, so that's one thing. And there's a chart in Planet of the Humans where you see our population increase, and I don't know if this is on camera, but literally it's, you know, if you chart it for the last 10,000 years, it's just like a spike that goes up into outer space. We almost oh, yeah. couldn't graph it. Sure. So again, I'm challenging everyone to, to ask our assumption that that's going to, stay up there somehow and not collapse when no other species could or would ever do that. Um, but here's here's the twist I would make. And this is the twist the environmental movement, they've, they've conflated what's good for us with what's good for the planet. So I'm talking about what's unsustainable is that at some point that 97% of the mammals are gone. At some point, the insect collapse is gonna get us. At some point, overfishing. Um, I think that point's now arriving as we see the degradation of the forest all across the planet. Um, you know, so climate change, the things that are happening that are labeled climate change are a result of this long human effort um, to where agriculture comes in, the climate, the climate gets drier, drought is often ensued, deserts have often been created. So if, if you get away from the reality, okay, I'm okay right now, we are supporting 8 billion people, and look at nature is not okay. You, you know, and I, I want to come down to, to um, Texas, if anybody's listening, they just cleared one of the last patches of tall grass prairie, I think it's called black grass prairie in Texas, where you live, for a solar panel array. And I was just doing a little research on that. 99.9% .9 of the tall grass prairie in Texas has been eliminated already. Yeah. So we're betting our lives and our futures on the, this pushing nature beyond its limits like this isn't going to result in our own demise. And so I, whether this happens in 10 years or a thousand years or hundred years, we don't know, but that's basically my focus is that, you know, we have too short term of a view of humans and our rise uh, and, the, and the, the built in assumption that what is shall continue to be what exists. And we have. Do you see now where I'm going with the environmental? Movement? They just no, pulled no, it down I, to no, carbon I, and they're I, using I, this. I, fair fair yeah. enough. So then let me ask you another we'll push you a little bit more. So if I appointed you king, then, Jeff, if, I mean, I've suddenly can can wave a wand and I put you in charge of things you know, in charge of, you know, the, the, the handling social, the society now, what would you do? What would be the things that you would mandate? What would you require people to do? Use less, drive less? What, I mean, what would you, what are the, the, the prescriptions that you'd put out there? 
I would begin with the assumption that the only way out of this of this limits to growth that we're experiencing, and uh, and again, that's human centric, and the um, what I call the uh, human overshoot, and the collapse of humanity has not yet begun. We're right on that rough edge, but the collapse of nature is way far along. And I would want people to understand that that is the thing, the issue of our time, is that in the last 65 million years, no other species has done this annihilation of the natural world and depletion of resources, um, you know, since the demise of the dinosaurs. Sure. And I, I, you know, I hear what you're saying, but I just so, want to press you. I just want to press let, you. Let on, me get what, to what we would do. So that would be what my would you do? baseline assumption. Okay. Fair I would. I would get we together. I would get people together to make a plan to get from here in this extreme overshoot to where we're going to wind up. And my working assumption is we are going to wind up with far fewer humans and far less consumption. If we get there in an unplanned way, probably it's game over. Um, so that I would gonna actually, have, that we're going to have mass extinction or was, mass mass what mass mortality events of some caused by plague or or famine or well, something that those are that you that are you saying that you think those are inevitable? Every civilization has gone through that. Fair enough. To, okay. to think that we're not, uh, but I again, if I was the leader, the dear leader. I would not be the dude. I would get you need together. another title besides dear yeah, leader. Yeah. Kim Jong Un already has that one. That, that one's a little tarnished, my friend. I'd use something else. And if I was Bill McKibben, you know, I think we need to, to get together and put our heads together and hash this out. And um, I would bring my data and my experiences, and you would bring yours. And um, I mean, that that's what I want to be a... triggered by the film. It's a discussion where we all we have to all own what happens next. I got you. And so, so let me jump yeah. back to the, so, okay. So fair enough that we'd have a meeting of the minds and formulate some kind of plan, but let me go back to the film here because what you're talking about is provocative, Jeff. And I'm, you know, and I, I'm saying this respectfully, yeah. I think that it is provocative. And I think, you know, we need to, I want to, it's one of the reasons why I do the podcast. Who, what's my, what's my hurdle for the podcast? Yeah. Who's an interesting person? McKibben has agreed to be on the podcast, by the way, I'm going to record that in April. So that'll be fun. You know, I want to hear what he has to say. What's his plan, but back to planet of the humans and your what your role i guess that the the left broadly right i'll say the left the environmental left the ngo climate ngos that they saw you as the heretic and that they attacked you and michael moore is is that an apt way to think about how you were viewed by them as her, as a heretic who had to be had to be stopped who had to be stifled because i was frankly stunned that some of these academics would say this film should be should be uh prohibited that, the, that we cannot have this kind of speech and that to me is very dangerous but that but that they saw you and michael moore as heretics who had to be silenced and that maybe more than anything even around the film to me is is very troublesome because that we need we need free and open debate so did you, you see yourself as a heretic and a modern heretic and in, in in that kind of debate or how do you how and why do you think they That's saw you as so as so threatening again it's you know as I, I you can't bite the hand that feeds you and i think it comes down to to funding and um and uh fame and i think follow the money know, it's about follow the money it's about follow the money, but it's also if somebody appoints you a role that allows you to consider yourself, you know, the academic or environmental Jesus of the planet, you know, you've got this plan, how we're all going to be saved. Um, yeah, that's a pretty heavy thing to come down from. And um, universities, you know, I've heard from more than one person that if you question green energy, good luck getting, you know, your tenure track position, you know, at university. Um, and there, there's, you know, and I've heard of people being actually, you um, told by uh, their advisor that they couldn't get their PhD, that they were going to um, whatever you call that when you, but they were not going to, to um, proceed because um, they just couldn't, if you, because they're questioning green energy. It's like, so. So who's the environmental, it's, it's, you mentioned, I like this term, the environmental Jesus. Are you identifying someone as the environmental Jesus? Is, is you have someone in mind? Because that's a, that's a, I haven't heard that term before. I, it's an interesting one. Well, yeah, I mean, I think Bill McKibben fits that um, kind of pious, you know, and the, the smart thing he does is he'll drip, he'll throw enough stuff out there. He he has talked occasionally about um, growth must end. Um, and I, 
And uh, guess what? I have Bernie Sanders on tape saying that he doesn't think we can deal with climate and environmental catastrophe without ending growth. I have Van Jones on tape saying the same thing. So, I, you know, you, you know, maybe you can tell me what you think, but they just didn't want to let somebody that was questioning the Holy Grail, you know, into into the church, and. So, so then that is so that so because, well so what I hear you saying is that you do I mean that that you see right, just not in the way that you, you're but see you branding yeah, branding you as the heretic then the heretic must be punished the heretic must be excluded banished uh, sent to live in the woods in Beulah Michigan or something <laughs> you know, I'm, the heretic it's, it's weird though because what are we saying that environmentalists have not been saying in different ways forever except um, that. Um, the green emperor has no clothes. So you're calling out you know, the prescriptions. You're calling out their 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 recipe for redemption. Would that be a fair way to think about it? Calling that out, and I was very careful to introduce the concept of population. But if you go back and watch the film, I never mentioned population without consumption. So uh -huh. I have so much to say about the population movement making mistakes because you can't separate the two from each other. Um, gotcha. They're really the same sides of the same thing. I mean, what's the sustainable number of Elon Musk's based on his consumption? <laughs> think, that would be right zero. now. I think we have one too many. Yeah, <laughs> yeah how many one jets and cut houses and whatever? How much lithium? I look at you know, I live in Austin and they have a new Tesla Gigafactory out. It's out by the airport out east of town, and it's an enormous facility. I mean, just enormous. I mean, it's just, I don't know how long it is. It's just huge. It's three stories or four stories high, and I look at it and I think. You know, the entire structure is just a, a very long and expensive bet on lithium, the price of lithium, availability of lithium, copper, you know, cobalt, uh, you know, uh, steel, aluminum. It's a it's an in incredible investment in just a handful of commodities so that they can make their cars. Um, but let me get back to the film, if you don't mind, Jeff, because we're coming close to an hour uh, and I like to keep our, our podcast to about an hour. And again, my guest is Jeff Gibbs. He's the director of Planet of the Humans, which has been a very successful documentary, over 20 million views. You can find more about that on planetofthehumans.com. Um, was the film a success? I mean, you, we've talked a lot about things, you know, kind of more your view and how, but you, you obviously put a lot of your own life and a lot of own, your own money and effort and blood, sweat and tears. I, I've made only one film. I'm making another. I know how hard it is. When you look back at it, do you think it was a success? In some ways, it was a success beyond our wildest dreams because. How so? You know, as pain, and painful as, well, as painful as, as this is, they only attack um, our films because they threaten, somebody's threatened because they make a difference. And when I, I often tell filmmakers, if nobody's um, attacking you, you probably didn't make the right film. You uh -huh. didn't make the best possible film. Right. You know, on these topics. If, and uh, so the discussions have been stirred up. Um, you know, if you were to ask me before the film was released, if millions of people would see it, I would have been thrilled. Unfortunately, between the censorship and the... Um, the pandemic, I was not able to tour with the movie and have the discussions. Right. Um, I'm still, and, and I <clears throat> might have mentioned that to you when we talked before. I'd love to get out and have this discussion, and I love to listen. You know, I would when I come and talk with you, I would just, I want, I will shut up and listen to your best case for everything that you believe in and why, how you, why you feel that way, and just sure. like you're listening to me. Yeah. And um, so, but in another way, you know, we have. Um, no, we, the, the nightmare that green energy will save us, that's now being used to double down on environmental destruction, that battle, they've quadrupled their efforts. So in that way, I haven't succeeded and I must get back out. You know, right now, as we speak, um, there've been, there's a mass whale, um, die off, which is not that unusual, but it's from North Carolina to up to, um, uh, New England. And, you know, it just all happens to coincide with the, um, installation of offshore wind, uh, which they've been giving a permit to, to harm or injure or disturb up to 50,000 sea mammals, including up to, I think it's around a dozen endangered North Atlantic right whales, yeah. of which there's only a few hundred left. You know, uh, right now in, um, in Nevada, there are a couple of tribes and some environmental activists are fighting a lithium mine that's going to destroy a pristine um, area. Two summers ago, they 
moved hundreds of rare endangered desert tortoises and cut down Joshua trees to build another solar array. And lo and behold, many of the tortoises died. In Quebec, uh, they're talking about, they've been threatening to put in a, a rare earth mine, which right. you see in the film is one of the most, yeah. in, in, in between two First Nations communities um, with pristine waters all around. And, you know, hydro, we can talk about sometime. I think there's, if it's still going, there's a site C dam in British Columbia that the um, Canadian government, their environmental impact report said that this dam was more environmentally destructive than the tar sands, that so wow. much habitat right. and landscape would be destroyed. Right. So, so in some ways we got a lot of work to do and um, you know, and I'll just, on the, there's so much potential, you know, um, one guy in Canada who does speaking tours and was kind of bored he says, let me get you a, on a virtual speaking tour in Canada. I think we sold like 20,000 tickets to that, to a few little events. I mean, so yeah, they want to keep a little on the monster because that one guy helped us get around to, you know, probably millions, you know, I mean, there were newspaper articles all over Canada. Um, so that's what they fear is they fear our voices getting out there. They fear people like us talking. Uh, they They fear... Michael Mann and Josh Fox and us actually having to discuss these things. Um, so, so they um, fear the fear is of, of this open debate, which is really unfortunate. But, but I, what I hear you say is that it, when I ask you whether the film is a success, you'd I, what I'm hearing you say that, yes, you thought it was a success, that it, it, it reached more people than you ever thought that it would. So that's great. And it's, it that's gratifying. And that's gratifying. I, I mean, it must be gratifying for you because you put a, a tremendous effort into it. Well, so we're right at about an hour, Jeff. So I'd, I'd like to keep these podcasts at about that length. Um, I have a few standards that I do uh, in my podcast. I ask people to introduce themselves. And then at the end, I ask them what they're reading. What books are you reading today? What uh, What's on the top of your bookshelf, book list, book pile? Um, by, um, well, that's a good question. I just recently read The Painted Bird, uh, a novel, and I'm reading a book about the the um the black grass prairie in texas uh -huh. and um, black, black black land prairie i believe it's the tall grass black prairie, land, prairie yeah, black, was, yeah okay, okay go ahead thank you for correcting me so i'm just i just started that um and the painted and, uh, the painted yeah, bird the painted bird do you know the uh, author on them um the painted i can, I, bird, I can look yeah. it up you said it's a novel it really yeah um um yeah I, oh, Jersey uh, Kaczynski. Uh, is that right? Jersey Kaczynski. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, 1965 uh, mo novel. Yeah. And um, a few other books um, but that I can't remember right now. But yeah, nope. that's that's basically what I do in the evening. No problem. So then the last question, uh, Jeff, and uh, this one, uh, again, is one I ask of everybody. What gives you hope? Um, the end of hope. Give me hope. <laughs> I'm sorry. Explain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've not had anything we're in the like time that. When, yeah, I think we're we're in the time when only doom and gloom can save us. You know? <laughs> but, no, neither extreme is good. I think, uh, you know, I spent a couple hours talking with Chris Hedges, the author. I don't know if you're familiar with Chris, but um, a great writer. He wrote a book, War is a Force that Gives Life Meaning. And uh, what he learned from being and living and working in the war zones was that the optimists wind up dying, and the pessimists, of course, wind up giving up. But it's the people who make a realistic assessment of the weapon systems down the road and what's around them and what's happening who look with clear eyes, they're going to be the survivors. So and I that was, think and that's, that's you, you said know, Chris Chris Hughes, right? Did I hear you correctly? Chris Hedges. Hedges, that's right. Okay, the, now I know who you're talking about. He used to write for the New York Times, yeah. if I recall. Yeah, Chris Hedges. He used to write okay. for the New York Times. Yeah. Another person who's been marginalized for the for his anti-war views on the uh he was fired from the new york times for um opposing the war in iraq mm -hmm. you know so um so what gives you hope is I the, hope, you, said, to, you said is the end of hope that we we need a more it's our opportunity you know we're the species that has used our magic powers of technology and what i would call delusion is a magic power you know we can imagine we can think that we've we've used that only to serve ourselves to serve perpetual growth. Um, I think we can use that awareness to really examine what we've done, who we are, and how we're, where we're going to go next. Um, 
and we do, even though when it might seem hopeless, um, we have to dismiss, we have to work out what all the false solutions are. But, you know, I think we can, we're capable of changing in surprising ways um, and being stubborn as hell and never changing. So which will come to the <laughs> fore? Stay tuned. And that's what's exciting is that we still have the chance to figure all this out and have these discussions and um, determine what happens next. But it ain't going to be a world powered by, you know, solar panels, wind, turb wind turbines that gets us out of this. Well, that's a good place to stop. Um, Jeff, I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, you know, I'm glad we connected uh, now a few weeks ago and, uh, um, you know, look forward to talking more. As I said, you know, my, what I, the reason I do this podcast is I get to scratch my own itch. I get to talk to people who I think are interesting, and that's the only, the only hurdle I have. Uh, my guest has been Jeff Gibbs. He's the director of Planet of the Humans, which, of course, was a wildly successful documentary. Uh, you can find out more about it on planetofthehumans.com. It's also available on a lot of different streaming platforms, including Amazon Prime, uh, YouTube, uh, and many others. So, uh, Jeff, thanks a million for coming on the Power Hungry Podcast. It's been great fun. Thanks, Robert. Very good. And to all you out there in podcast land, tune in for the next episode of the Power Hungry Podcast. Until then, see ya.